camera up on and it's a little well it's a camera that has a little stem and it has a ball on top it's like a I call it an orbits camera but it's got a cactus on one side it's got another cacti on the other and it's got another plant it's on a plant stand and if i wiggle or step on the deck it bounces <laughs> this little stand because have you ever seen one of those little old oh i don't know they put them in restrooms sometimes over toilets, you know, that have these long, tall stand-up things. And you put towels on the side and you got shelves. And they're little cheapy metal things made like either at a Walmart or a very inexpensive place. And, well, <laughs> I took it apart and I made part of it into a plant stand. <laughs> so, whenever there's any wobbling, you know why now. <laughs> because it bounces. <laughs> I think that uh, people miss out on the opportunities that God gives to develop and use the things that you have all about you, that one man's trash might be another man's treasure, but the point is, is that if you can make a use of it, why not? And then decorate it and enjoy it for what it is and give thanks to God for it. Speak to my heart, O oh God. Maybe a little quick reading because it's a little long. But K. Arthur's like that. When you find it difficult to trust God, when you have a need, material, emotional, or spiritual, do you ever feel like you have to do something more than just trust, obey, and pray? We fret, we worry, we strive, we wrangle, we manipulate, we scheme, we're frustrated, we're anxious, we're troubled, we wring our hands in despair, and sometimes we panic. Why? Because, beloved, we do not obey and we do not pray. We do not really believe that God can do what he says he can. We do not really trust him. If we did, we wouldn't worry. Oh, intellectually, we may have it straight that he is sovereign and that he is the ruler over all, but we can't seem to trust his rulership, especially when we need him the most. We may know that he is a God of love, but we forget or we resist committing ourselves fully to his care. Somehow, no matter what we know about God, we don't always feel that we can trust him. So we try to handle matters ourselves. We step out on our own. Or we forget to consult with our Father. We leave him out of our plans and actions until we become absolutely desperate and then cry out in need rather than in plan. We forget that God is God, able to change the hearts and minds of men and women able and willing to supply all our needs, able to move heaven and earth, able to cause all things to work together for our good and his glory. Somehow, whatever our need, whether it be material, emotional, or spiritual, we feel that we have to do something more than trust, obey, and pray. Isn't that true? Isn't that true for you? I learned Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 at a very early walk in my life with the Lord and for me it was kind of like you know I just got to turn over to him and let it go you know <laughs> so for me it's pretty simple but I know it gets confusing for other people but isn't that true for you true at least more often than you want it to be or more often than you know that it should be why because so often we don't know what it means to commit everything to God in prayer we commit some things or only the big things or only things that we think he wants to hear I'm not talking about badgering him in order to get things which are not in his will or in his timing. And I'm not talking about trying to manipulate God through your faith. Faith in your word or in your positive confession or some other obsession that you think is a profession to get some possession that you think you ought to have. No. Rather than in his word and according to his character. Rather, I'm talking about prayer as a way of life, a constant communion, that causes you to commit everything to your Father for his leadership, for his choices, for his anointing, for his provision, according to his way and according to his time when he chooses. True, prayer is always according to his will, or true prayer is always according to his will. Effective prayer, that which is born of the Spirit, does not rip verses out of context and fling them at the feet of God's footstool as though God need to be reminded and expect him to answer them simply because you have faith and you are 
telling him that he has to do it. Effective prayer comes when we abide in him, live in him, and we know him. And his words abide in us, and we know what they are, and they are fulfilled through us as we understand them. And we ask according to his will, and his word, and his plan. In this age, when there is so much emphasis on man's abilities, on self, and self-image, in this age, when our lives are so busy, when we live in the midst of constant noise, when the world is clamoring for our dollars, our allegiance, our attention, our vote, our personal time, our volunteerism, it is easy to forget to be still and know He is God. It is so easy to forget that our Father, who sits as sovereign over all mankind and over the whole world, is waiting for us. Waiting for us to bring all our concerns and lay them down at his feet, not to pick them up. We forget that he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. James 4, 2 and 3. I have been reading through the Old Testament for my quiet time, and I don't think I have ever been aware, as I am now, of how sensitive God is to the cries of his people. How often I have reminded our Father of that lately as I have cried out to him in my impotence. And he has not failed me. Why? Because he is God, the unchangeable, faithful Father who keeps his word. Just the other day I was reading the story of Hezekiah, one of the kings of Judah. Let me share a little bit about him, as I believe it will bless you as it has me. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, had already captured and dispersed the northern kingdom of Israel. He was on a conquering rampage. Nation after nation had gone down in defeat to the mighty Assyrian Empire. Now Sennacherib wanted to add the southern kingdom to his last victim, to his list of victories. And if I keep reading this, I don't think that we'll stay within the 10 minute time frame. So the reality of all of this brings us to the point of understanding that if we trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning on to our own understanding, if we do in all our ways acknowledge him, then he does direct our path. But if we don't trust him, if we don't seek him, if we don't believe in him, if we don't do as we know we ought to do, which is to find, follow, and let him lead, guide, and provide for us, then what are we complaining for when we don't have what we thought God would give us in the first place? Did you know that your father delights to give to his children good things? He does, in all the little ways and the big ones. But the point that is forgotten is in all your ways, do you acknowledge him? All is all. Like I tell my wife regularly, if you can't imagine God when you're sitting on the toilet, you probably can't imagine God everywhere, always, in everything that you do. And people think that's a little base or crass, or for some, gross. But for other people, it's a normal bodily function that goes on on a regular basis, and in the reality of what God is, He created us, and He knows it, and He is inside of us. And so, if you can't take God in all things, then you're probably not going to take God in the major things when you really need Him. You're just going to want Him to fix what you've already screwed up. But I can tell you this, if you take God in all things, everywhere, and anywhere you are, right now, as you are, then not only are you trusting in the Lord, but He will, He promised, He will direct your path. And as you go down that road, <laughs> I can tell you this, you're gonna enjoy two blessings. One, you'll know him. And two, knowing him will bless you.